morning, everyone. And I guess after listening to um, uh, my friend John here, my role is, is to convince you that land does matter, you know? <laughs> uh, so I have maybe to change the title. And But land occupies only 30% of the area, the surface area of the Earth. So I mean, he's on the majority side, so he could claim that land doesn't matter. For me to make land matter, I have to scale it down to the regional scales. And so I focus on areas where land really is the majority of the surface, and so land does matter at those, at those scales. And so my talk is about regional climate over lands. And I would like to leave you with two messages. One of them is, is land surface processes do matter in shaping climate variability at regional scales, and I'm going to show example for that. And then the second message relates to the theme of this symposium, which is when it comes to science, actionable science, and science and action, we have to focus on climate processes that are relevant to society. And climate processes that are relevant to society usually are, take place at regional and local scales. And so I'm going to provide a few examples of that as much as the time would allow. The picture I have up there is a picture from Africa. Um, you see the Sahara Desert, and you see when you look at land masses, large part of them is deserts, but you see vegetation. And vegetation is important because it not only plays a role in the water and energy cycles, but also in the carbon cycle, and that's something I'm going to touch on. So being a hydrologist, I would like to start with um, some picture of the global um, rainfall distribution. This is the global rainfall distribution from TRIM, and it shows the distribution of rainfall uh, basically, um, uh, if you look at July, maximum of rainfall occurs um, over the Western Pacific Ocean, but there is maximum that occurs over Africa and over South America. And you could also see the monsoonal rainfall and how that extends into Asia. While there is recognition on the role of sea surface temperature in shaping those rainfall distributions and circulations um, over the ocean, it's not very clear what variable over land plays the role of SST in basically dictating the uh, circulations and the rainfall distributions that we see over, over land, and that's something I'm going to try and address. And in addressing that, I resort to this set of observation that came from the um, five experiment which was done over Kansas uh, during the 1980s in North America. And it looks at two uh, fundamental variables. Uh, one relate to the radiation balance at the surface, which is the albedo, the fraction of solar radiation that gets reflected. And the other is less known ratio, which is the Boyne ratio, uh, which relates to the ratio of sensible heat flux to latent heat flux. And that's basically the partition of the energy into sensible and latent forms. Both of them decline consistently and persistently with increasing soil moisture and with denser vegetation. And that has to do with the hydrologic cycle where basically soil moisture, uh, the water in the soil absorbs more of the photons that gets incident on the surface. And also the control of vegetation and soil moisture and evaporation would increase evaporation as the soil gets wetter and that would tend to reduce the point ratio. So I take that fundamental understanding and I try to put it into a framework, a simplified frame, framework on how does the land surface play a role in shaping these distributions of rainfall and dictating the kind of circulation that you may get. So both of them, the lowering of the Boyne ratio and the lowering of the surface albedo works through the radiation balance and the land surface to enhance the net surface radiation over, over land. And as John was saying earlier, the ocean is a fluid where heat could be transported laterally. Over land, it's a solid, and so we cannot have lateral transport of heat and that's why the net surface radiation over land dictates the total flux of heat, including sensible and latent forms. And that's so net radiation over land is a more important variable than over the ocean because over land, that's the only source of the total flux of heat, then that would dictate the energy in the boundary layer, and that will dictate the vertical uh, distribution of energy in the atmosphere and the horizontal distribution in energy in the boundary layer, and both of those will dictate the um, occurrence of rainfall and the uh, development of circulation. What you get from this framework is a positive feedback by which wet soil moisture conditions, denser vegetation, would lead to condition that would enhance the, um, the uh, rainfall and would lead to more wet conditions and more vegetation. The 
albedo side of this is basically rooted or very consistent with the theory of Charney in 1970s, where he proposed that the albedo feedback at the desert borders in Africa, you know, the uh, basically albedo will tend to reduce the energy at the surface, and that will tend to uh, basically enhance the subsidence at the desert borders. So it's very, it's very similar in that, in that sense. However, the, uh, the other side of the story here comes from the necessity to include water vapor when we think of those dynamics, something that Charney did not include in his original study. In the 1980s and 90s, a very famous or very popular problem to look at land-atmosphere interactions is the deforestation of the Amazon. This is a work by Carlos Nobre in which um, basically you look at the climate with and without the Amazon forest. And what GCM simulate is a very interesting pattern in which at the lower layers of the atmosphere you have divergence of air and the upper levels you have convergence. So, and if you think about it, that's weakening of the atmospheric circulation that bringing the moisture toward the forest regions. So that that's basically the, suggests a positive feedback in which um, existence of vegetation is helping to create the conditions that will sustain the vegetation under those, under those conditions. So the um, same GCM that were used to study the Amazon deforestation have been used to study the impact of soil moisture on rainfall. This is, this is from a study by Randy Koster um, uh, from NASA in which they identified three regions as hotspots for areas where soil moisture conditions are important in explaining variability of precipitation. Again, Africa stands out, the same region that Charney looked at earlier, and by focusing on Africa, I would like to draw your attention to this region of Africa, West Africa, where there is a sharp gradient of rainfall from the coast further into the, into the north. And you have also a sharp gradient in terms of distribution of vegetation. Guiling Wang here at MIT um, around 2000 developed the model that utilized the fact that this region has a high degree of zonal symmetry. Um, and so she used that model and added to it a component that represents the dynamics of vegetation so that trees and grass are no longer just parameters that are specified in the model, but also variables that evolve as the climate changes and as the climate varies. And so here she simulates the equilibrium distribution of precipitation and the equilibrium distribution of net primary productivity, which they are coupled quite significantly in this. And then she did a very interesting set of experiments in which Focusing on the desert border, the grass region in the desert border, she started varying the density of the vegetation in that area. And here you see the kind of equilibria, climate equilibria, similar to what John talked about earlier, looking at the ocean. There is also the possibility for multiple climate equilibria over land regions. And here she simulates three types of equilibria that basically correspond to greener conditions and more desert conditions in this part of the ocean. And so that's the basis for the first time over land to have the theory that basically predicts potential occurrence of multiple climate equilibria in the coupled land atmosphere system based on a physically based climate model. So at the same time Wang was doing her studies here at MIT, Martin Clausen and his colleagues at the Max Planck Institute in Germany were looking at the same problem from the theoretical perspective and they defined two types of basically functions. One defines vegetation and how it relates to precipitation and the other how precipitation relates to vegetation and land surface condition. The same kind of, of, of uh, description I had, I had earlier. So if you think of it, this equilibrium point that they define in their solution here, this equilibrium point basically um, uh, connect to this, um, uh, I think this is not working here. So connect to the, so, so it basically the three points here, the equilibrium points match directly into the, into the three equilibria that, that I, I described earlier. So, the same framework uh, basically um, maps directly into this theoretical framework for studying multiple equilibrium systems with, with three equilibria basically um, and having the potential of, of switching from one to another. In, in, in one simulation, she was able to simulate the two stable equilibria, but even more interestingly, the unstable equilibria so that if you start the system close to this unstable equilibria, then the system would move 
depending on, on the interannual variability to one of the two stable equilibria. It's a very interesting concept that's actually very similar to the concept that was proposed by Ed Lorenz in one of his papers about intransitivity. So the system is intransitive in the sense that if you set it in one initial condition, then it will, it will continue in that, in, that, in that equilibrium. So in order to test this theory, you know, now I connect to some of the earlier presentations. Um, David McGeehan talked about, about the, um, the paleo climate of, of Africa. And here, these are pictures from caves in the middle of the Sahara Desert showing animals that would not really be, you would not be able to see in today's climate. So there is evidence that 6,000 years ago, the Sahara Desert was much wetter. So these are periodic levels that were much higher than what, what's being now. And so the expansion of the Sahara Desert, something that happens 6,000 years ago, 5,500 years ago, is a good test bed for, for, this, for these concepts. Here is a reconstruction of that history, and it shows how in the last 10,000 years, the climate of the Sahara basically evolved with human settlements that were uh, scattered around, um, around uh, the desert area, basically with the change in the climate, people moved to the Nile Valley, and that corresponds to the, actually the initiation of when the pharaonic civilization started around, around the same time where that climate change happened. So not all climate change would really result in negative so impacts in a way that the emergence of the pharaonic civilization was related to a climate change that was um, that, that basically with the expansion of the Sahara of the Sahara Desert. What's interesting here is the magnitude of this shift is about four degrees. And that's what we tried to test the model. Iris Ari, working here at MIT, tried to see what kind of combination of processes would lead to expansion of the Sahara Desert by those four degrees. And so she had a set of experiments in which she varied three factors. One of them is the solar forcing, so basically the orbital forcing and its impact on distribution of solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere. The other factor is inclusion or exclusion of this biospheric feedback, the vegetation uh, rainfall feedback. And the third factor is basically the initial condition. And so this is, this is done with an initial condition of vegetation that basically looked similar to today's vegetation. And you know, here you see that only with the orbital parameters, you have an expansion of the desert border corresponding to 200 millimeters of about one degree. When you include the vegetation rainfall feedback, that moves to become like two degrees, which is still smaller than what had been observed, which is about four degrees. And the only way you could simulate those four degrees is not only by recognizing the changes in the orbital parameters, recognizing the biosphere atmosphere feedback, but also recognizing that you have to start from initial conditions that look like what had been observed 6,000 years ago. So this is really very important in, in that, you know, this is not only that the intransitivity in the climate system is important, but without recognizing it, you may not be able to simulate the past climate. And so this is a good case for sensitivity to initial conditions, not for weather systems, which is something that we all recognize after the work of Lorenz and, and, and appreciate, but for also climate systems where the initial conditions for what you do the simulations could also be important in what kind of climate that you would simulate. So with that, I would like to quickly then move to the second part of, of what I would like to talk about in a few minutes and give you examples that actually respond to what we heard earlier in the keynote address about what kind of science that we need to do in order to motivate action on climate change. And so to, for, for climate change impact studies, land is the domain that we will have to focus. And here I would like to basically provide a few examples from my own research. This is a recent paper that we have about heat waves in Asia. And it focuses on the Persian Gulf. And the Persian Gulf, to many, uh, in many ways, could be looked at as a lake on a land surface. It's a very shallow system of about 38 meters in depth. And it receives water from the ocean, but receives very little heat. And that's why the lateral transport of heat is not important. And the theory that I described earlier would predict that you would have much more energy in the boundary layer over this wet area. Um, and that's, and that's what, what's being observed in the current climate. And here, these are projections into future climate that basically point to the fact that this, the Persian Gulf, which we describe as the hottest spot on Earth, when you think of the total energy, including water vapor, could have significant risk of developing conditions that would limit the habitability of the region. And so the 
Persian Gulf is the hottest spot on Earth now, and so it's likely that in the future, with global warming, that that's where a region where, where conditions could, could become less habitable compared to another region. Another example of systems that are important to study, infectious diseases. This is work done here at MIT, developing a new class of models that are suited for simulating the processes that occur between the climate forcing, the hydrology, the entomology, and leading to the actually the immunology, which is the process within the human body. We think of the, the immunology of a human being is like an integrated, an integrated measure of, cli of past climate variability. Think about that. And so this class of models have been used to try and simulate what would be the impact of climate change on malaria transmission in Africa, one of the major global health challenges in that, in that part of the world. And here, actually climate change is, there is less, we, we show that there is less risk for expansion of malaria as a result of climate change. The same reasons that, you know, with the warming, the Persian Gulf, you have a high risk. With malaria, climate change kills mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, survival of mosquitoes is a strong function of temperature. And so with warming, you have less mosquitoes, you may have less malaria. So there is a less, there is a less risk of malaria in Africa as a result of climate change. And I would like to conclude by closer to home, this is an example of agriculture in the Midwest, also mentioned earlier in the keynote address about droughts in, in, in North America as a result of climate change. And there have been GCM and, and regional climate studies that show that what this figure compiles is a unique data set on the components of the hydrologic cycle, starting with precipitation, stream flow, uh, soil moisture, groundwater, temperature for the state of Illinois, large area around the state of Illinois. And you could see that how these variables are connected, for example, the drought of 88 and the flood of 93 and so on. However, what's really interesting is that you don't see any trend. You don't see any trend during the last 25 years in, in the hydrologic cycles. So contrary to the model predictions, which suggest that you may have droughts evolving in this part of the world, we don't see any evidence of that in the observation, which highlights the significant uncertainty that would come when we talk about regional impacts of climate change on variables that are important to society, like, like soil moisture in the American Midwest. I conclude by just emphasizing that to carry all these impact studies, we need to have a new different type of models, models that are tailored to do processes at regional scale at very high resolution based on solid understanding of processes that are important to society. And in developing those models, we increasingly realize that there are many issues, there are many challenges in representation of processes, representation of clouds, convection, land surface processes, problems that have been identified now for decades. Progress has been made in addressing them, but there are still remaining many issues that need to be addressed. So the models, the tools that we use to make these predictions are still um, um, imperfect and, and they need a lot of work. So with that, I conclude and I will take questions. Thank you. Time for one quick question. So it wasn't clear from your description of the Sahara Desert what the human impact was. Are, are you suggesting that humans through manipulating vegetation caused expansion or are you saying that's not? So this is looking at the climate of that region 6,000 years ago. So the question is about the role of the human um, activity on shaping the change of the Sahara Desert. The expansion of the Sahara Desert that happens about 5,500 years ago is the largest change in land cover that has happened in the last 6,000 years. And so that change actually happened mainly due to natural processes. Changes in the orbital parameters, which change the distribution of the incoming solar radiation, the timing and spatial distribution of the incoming solar radiation, amplified through um, um, uh, biosphere atmosphere interactions, the kind of feedbacks I talked about earlier, but also we show that in trying to reproduce those history, you need to include initial conditions. You need to start from vegetative conditions that are similar to what had been the case there. And so the, for the past, we don't think that human activities played a significant role in, in, in triggering that, that expansion. <laughs> 